This video was brought to you by Ground News. As you surely already know, over the weekend, the Wagner Group and their leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, staged what looked like an attempted coup in Russia. In fact, Prigozhin's march on Moscow was only stopped by a last-minute deal negotiated by Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko. And that deal, in effect, implies Wagner's withdrawal from Ukraine too. Now, we made a whole video breaking down what happened over the weekend, which is linked in the description. So instead, in this one, we're going to be taking a look at what this whole episode means for Ukraine specifically. And we're going to break it down into three parts. Firstly, we're going to talk about what the deal actually means for Wagner troops and the Russian army. Secondly, we're going to talk about how the end of the Wagner group might affect the Russian army tactically. That is to say, how it might affect their defensive and offensive capabilities on the battlefield in the short to medium term. And then thirdly, we're going to talk about how it might affect Russia's strategic thinking. In effect, how it might impact the Kremlin's objectives and their long-term thinking. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. So let's start at the beginning, how the end of Wagner will impact the Russian army. According to Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov, Prishkovin's deal with Lukashenko basically splits the Wagner group into two parts, the troops that didn't take part in the mutiny and those that did. According to Peshkov, those troops that didn't take part are set to be folded into the regular Russian army, as the Russian Ministry of Defense originally planned to do, while those who did take part in the mutiny would get legal impunity. But there's no suggestion that these people will be folded into the regular Russian army. Now, given that Prigogine claimed that he was supported by 25,000 men during the mutiny, which would account for the vast majority of Wagner troops, that leaves only a few troops left to be folded into the regular Russian army. And the vast majority of those given legal immunity will probably either follow Prishkovin into Belarus or be redeployed abroad. For those of you who don't know, Wagner has a significant presence in Africa and the Middle East and are currently involved in the ongoing civil war in Sudan. Therefore, most Wagner troops who aren't folded into the Russian army will probably look for redeployments here, because these roles are significantly better paid than working for the regular Russian army. In practice then, this means that the Russian army will only get a handful of new troops from Wagner who didn't support Prishkovin's coup, which leaves the vast majority of Wagner troops withdrawing from both Russia and Ukraine. Which brings us on to the second part of this video. How will Wagner's effective dissolution affect Russia tactically? And the bad news for Ukraine is that Wagner's dissolution is unlikely to have much of an impact in the immediate term. That's because most of Wagner's troops were previously focused in the east, in and around Bakhmut. And these forces were replaced by the regular Russian army at the end of May and early June. Similarly, reports suggest that there's no Wagner presence in the south around Kherson, where the heaviest fighting has been taking place this month. Largely because Wagner were designed for offensive rather than defensive operations. So while the whole affair might have had a detrimental impact on the Russian army's morale, especially in the Air Force, given that something like seven helicopters were downed during Wagner's march on Moscow, all in all, it's unlikely to make a significant difference to Ukraine's counteroffensive prospects in the immediate term. However, in the medium term, things will start to look a little more promising for Ukraine because the dissolution of Wagner will put even more pressure on Russia's manpower shortage. There's some provisional evidence to suggest that despite claiming to have hundreds of thousands of troops in reserve, thanks to Putin's partial mobilization last year, the Russian army is actually running low on both troops and weapons. And this would explain why the Kremlin is trying so hard to force the various private military companies to fold into the regular Russian army, even though it was always going to provoke resistance from Prigozhin. Similarly, the fact that Russia is apparently buying back parts of tanks and missiles from Myanmar and has failed to make arms deliveries to India suggests that Russia is running low on material. 
Now, this doesn't mean that we should expect Russia to face critical shortages of personnel or material in the immediate future. But in the medium term, the dissolution of Wagner will put more strain on Russia's manpower reserves, especially because Putin clearly isn't keen on another wave of mobilization. All in all, while Wagner's dissolution doesn't mean that we should expect a sudden breakthrough in Ukraine's counteroffensive, it could erode Russia's military capacity in the medium term. So, on to the third part of this video. How Wagner's effective dissolution will affect Russia strategically. And to be honest, this is where things get really bad for the Kremlin. Wagner's dissolution means that the Kremlin desperately needs to change strategy, either by escalating or by suing for peace. And this is for three reasons. Firstly, it's clear that the political situation within Russia is becoming more unsustainable. While the majority of Russians apparently support the so-called special military operation, they're clearly not happy with the way it's being prosecuted, which is why Wagner were greeted with such a warm reception in Rostov, and why, conversely, Russia's returning security forces were met with angry jeers. Also, Russians are less likely to support the war now that the war has come to Russia, both in Belgorod, where pro-Ukrainian groups are staging regular incursions, and now in central Russia via the Wagner mutiny. Basically, the war is now affecting ordinary Russians, who aren't happy about it, which puts serious political pressure on Putin to end the special military operations somehow. Secondly, the dissolution of the Wagner Group means that Russia is unlikely to gain any territory in the future. And that's because the regular Russian army has proven totally incapable of making significant territorial gains, which is why they had to get Wagner to do it for them in Bakhmut. The point we're making here is that even if Russia's defensive capability isn't all that much affected by Wagner's dissolution, if you don't have any offensive capacity, you can only really go backwards. Which again, puts more pressure on Putin to escalate or sue for peace before he loses more territory. Thirdly, a mutiny will make Russia even less likely to receive international support. After all, no country is going to stick their neck out to support a regime that could be toppled at any moment. Similarly, Putin might have been hoping that one of their allies, like China or Belarus, might come and bail him out by providing some sort of decisive military support. But these countries are now significantly less likely to support him because A, it looks like he could be toppled at any moment, and B, because he looks, well, a bit incompetent. These three reasons combined all put pressure on Putin to change strategy, either by escalating or by suing for peace. And given that Putin's only real options for escalation are either another wave of mobilization or a tactical nuke, neither of which are great options from the Kremlin's perspective, this probably means that peace is much more likely than it was a week ago. Now, many of the stories we cover here are often complex and nuanced, and our goal has always been to shed some light on these stories so that you can better understand what's going on in the world around you. Unfortunately, though, many news outlets use this complexity and nuance to frame a story in a certain way. Which is why I'm excited about today's sponsor, Ground News. Ground News is a very useful website and app which I use every day, which lets you compare related articles in one place from thousands of sources around the world and across the political spectrum with context about the source of the information. For instance, take this story about Zelensky's reaction to Wagner's attempted coup in Russia. Ground News allows me to see which outlets are reporting on this story most. In this case, only 29% of articles come from right-leaning outlets. It also lets me compare headlines and stories by outlet, allowing me to get a fuller picture of what's really happening. Then, if I want to dive deeper into any of these reports, I can be taken there with just one tap, with Ground also providing reporting accuracy and bias scores for each outlet. Now, I have ground on my phone's home screen, and I genuinely can't recommend them enough. So because of this, we've decided to offer a special 30% discount on Ground News' Vantage subscription. And you can only access this discount by clicking the link below. So check it out and help support an independent news platform working to make the media landscape more transparent.